teens, welcome back. It's good to see you all again here virtually. Uh, we're back here in the youth room at Eastside Baptist Church in Thomasville, Georgia, and we are in week two of our video series with you guys. And I guess we're in week four or week five of our great social experiment in, in social distancing and our response to the COVID-19 outbreak. I uh, hope you guys are doing well. Um, would love to hear from you guys. Would love to know what's going on in your life. Uh, at the end of the session tonight, once again, I'll have my phone number and my uh, email address on the screen. I appreciate Sam responding last week uh, with his email address and his phone number, so I have a way of getting in touch with him and talking to him. I've been able to contact him a little bit. Apparently, the rest of you guys don't have a way to reach out to me um, because you didn't send me anything. So I'm going to go ahead and make that offer again this week. Uh, email me, text me, let me know what's going on in your life. I'd love to have a way to communicate with you. I'd still love to get together on Zoom uh, to be able to see your faces and, and just kind of hear from you how you're doing through this process. Uh, continue to pray for you guys. Again, would love to know if there's anything I can pray for specifically for you. And uh, uh, truly looking forward to being back together again at some point. I know when this, when this is lifted. Uh, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, I wanted to say a quick congratulations to Abby Jackson for her 17th birthday this week. Abby, you're lucky. Uh, we're not together, so I can't make you stand up in the chair and have us all sing to you. And since I'm the only one in the room tonight, I'm not going to serenade you here. So you are very fortunate. Uh, no, no happy birthday to you. But when we do get back together again, those of you that have had a birthday will have the honor of coming up front, standing in the chair and letting us sing to you. Uh, Abby, I hope it was a great birthday. Sorry we didn't get to see you. Um, but uh, we are looking forward to getting together again when we get to the backside of all of this. Um, Looking forward tonight to being in God's Word again. We're going to be looking at uh, the last week of Christ's life uh, here on earth. This is uh, the week between the Palm Sunday, which we, we celebrated last Sunday, and Easter, which we're celebrating this Sunday. It's called the Passion Week or the Holy Week. It's the last week of Christ's life of ministry here on the earth. And so we're going to spend some time in Mark 14 tonight looking at one of the last days of Jesus' life here on earth. And it, and it gives us a, a perspective, a look into his heart for us. And God's love for us. And so we're going to spend some time in Mark 14 tonight. But before we go there, we're going to spend a couple of minutes playing a game. And again, uh, the challenge will be we're using games that hopefully you have the material at home. And you guys can play along with us, send it in, and let us see it. And uh, we'll, we'll include you in next week's video. So we're going to take a moment, switch things up, and get our set set up. And then we'll play a couple minutes and win at games. And then we'll come back on the backside and spend some more time here in God's Word. Welcome back to our second week here on our world famous set of Minute to Win It games. We are excited to introduce you to two new games. Now we're using games that you should maybe have stuff at home that you can play along. And oh, that reminds me. So uh, last week we had a, uh, uh, what, was the, what was the game we played last week? The, oh, the, the cookie slide, the cookie. Face the Cookie. Played Face the Cookie. Uh, and I challenged you guys to, um, to see who could beat our two cookies in a minute. Elena and I both uh, finished with two. Uh, Alyssa finished with zero and Ansley finished with zero. And uh, the challenge was to, to record it. If you could prove that you did more than two in one minute, uh, we would declare you the winner and we'd include your video in this week's video. So I have a $20 cash prize. I want to give congratulations to this week's winner. Give me a drum roll. Me and Elena because None of you guys sent anything in. So this $20 cash prize goes into my pocket. I appreciate you not playing so I can win. Uh, and uh, just a reminder, we will be playing again this week. I don't know what next week's prize will be. Uh, I will tell you, I heard through a little bird that some of you guys said that they were not going to um, submit videos of them trying to manipulate their face to get a cookie from their eye to their mouth because they might look silly. So uh, I don't know who that might have been. But uh, Abby Jackson, I, I, I'm on to you. I know what's going on. So, hey, submit, play along. If you can play any of these games. This week's we have two different games, and they're going to be a total time. So you'll have to video two different games. This one's called Stack Attack. We have 21 solo cups. Uh, you can use any similar size cups. And the object of the game is when we say go, you're going to stack. The first layer will be six wide, second layer five, four, three, two, and one. Once, that once the top cup is on, and stays on for two seconds, then you restack them down and eventually get them back into the stack like this. When you are done, you stop your timer. Uh, Alyssa's got her clock, her watch, I've got my watch. So we are going to 
be racing against each other. Now, it's going to be a total time of both games. So this game plus your time in our next game, which will introduce as soon as this one's done. So, you ready? Yes. You understand what we're doing? I do. Stacking six high, six levels high, all the way up. If a cup falls, you got to get it back up and on there. And that top one's got to sit on its own for, for two seconds. Second. Yep. All right. You ready? Are you trying your timer? I, I got gotcha. you. On your mark. Oh, you know, we don't have our minute to win it. Oh, well. So just imagine the minutes when it soundtrack going on in the background. Ready, on your mark, get set, put your cup on the table. Oh. Mark, get set, go. Sing it for us, Alyssa. Good. Six, oh shoot, one, two. Six on the bottom? Six on the bottom, four, five, three, four. I need to check my watch to make sure it's coming. Uh-huh, uh-oh, that's not right. really good. <laughs> I've got Alyssa. Oh, don't, don't knock the table. Two, one. All right, one on top. Sit for two seconds. One, two. All right, then slide them down, slide them down. Listen, meanwhile, it's disappearing under the table. All right, stacking them. Uh-oh, uh -oh, right, get them all stacked. This is not working. Dun, 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 dun. All right, so. Simple game, six or six rows high. You saw how the expert did it. You saw how not to do it. This was Alyssa's, this was a not to do it. Uh, our next game, so that set that one aside, that was called Stack Attack. This one's called Separation Anxiety. We have a bag of Skittles. Everybody take a bag of Skittles, and then we have five cups because there are five colors. Am I right on that? I believe so. Blue, pink, purple, green, blue, pink, purple, green, and red. So five colors, five cups. What you have to do on your video, when we say go, we'll start the timer, you have to take the, you have to take the bag, you have to open the bag, you have to pour all the contents on the table. Slide over so you're not getting in mine. And then you have to separate the Skittles into colors into five different cups. Five different cups, each for a color. Time starts when you rip the bag. Time finishes when the last Skittle goes in the cup, all right? And the great thing is, guys, if you play along, just get something you like, and you can eat them when you're done. Oreos last week, Skittles this week. See how it works for in our family. All right, ready? <laughs> On your mark, get ready. Oh, by the way, Alyssa's time last time was 41.72. My time was 33 and a half seconds. So she's got to make up eight seconds in this game. I think I'm doing it right. Ready? On your mark, get set, go. Oh, oh there's a lot of Skittles. Yeah. Okay, red, pink, oh, lots wow. of green. This is, okay, do I have a strategy? I got, I got strategy. I'm not gonna tell you my strategy though. Oh man, I don't think I'm gonna. You're not gonna make up eight seconds on me. Yes, I am. Oh, stink! Anything that falls on the floor, you gotta track down. Nothing's falling. Oh, stink. Are you kidding me? Done. That's not good. That's not good. Taking time? Yes, I am. Step in eight seconds? Done. <laughs> that is not right. Come on. Oh, wait. All right. Wait, what do you have? None of your business. All right, so that's the game. All right, so what you guys do. Uh, so our times today. Oh. Alyssa, oh. what was your time total? 115.14. Point one four. And uh, my total time was 116. So uh, I think I just was slow. See, I had to start the clock and then tear my my, my bag. So she had a little bit of an advantage. I had to too. Check your colors. All right, so fair and square. Much. Alyssa wins this week in our in-studio games. Make sure you record your videos, send it in to us, have fun doing it, and uh, see if you can beat our time. Uh, send in your video and uh, we'll include you next week. All right, we'll be right back. All right, hope you guys had fun watching that game. Hopefully you guys are gonna participate in that game this week and send in videos of you trying to beat Alyssa's time. Uh, again, I think there was just something wrong in my stopwatch. I can't believe that, uh, well, actually I just felt bad about beating her last week and so I was glad to give her a chance to win this week. She's pretty competitive and I don't know where she gets that from, but uh, she's a little competitive. I'm glad she had a chance to win and feel better about herself. If you have your Bibles or you have your phone, go ahead and turn with me to uh, Mark chapter 14. Mark is the second book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Uh, we are, uh, it's, it's, it's one of the four Gospels, and we've talked about the Gospels before. These are the, the, the narrative books that explain Christ's ministry here on earth. Mark was the earliest one written, uh, probably uh, written about 70, 60 AD, sometime in that period, about 20 or 30 years after Christ's death. And it gives us a narrative of Christ's life here on earth. And chapters 15 and six, or chapters 14 and 15 of the book tell us about the passion 
uh, the week of Christ's, uh, the last week of Christ's ministry here on earth, moving into his death and resurrection. And we're going to spend a few minutes tonight, Mark chapter 14. We're going to look at some, some of the ways, some of the things that Christ was experiencing in his last week uh, of ministry. And then we're going to look at his, his, his prayer in the garden of Gethsemane. Uh, it was the, uh, the night before his trial and his crucifixion. Jesus was very aware, being the Son of God, knowing all things, he was very aware of what was about to happen. And we see that through Mark chapter 14, this, this awareness, this, this looking ahead, this, this anticipation of the cross. And we see Christ's humanity revealed in his desire to spend time with friends in the last couple days of his ministry, and then his love for his disciples in the, in the, in the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper that he had before going out to the Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane. And so we're going to spend some time in that tonight. But first, before we get into that, let's pray quickly. Father, we are again grateful uh, for this week, Lord. In the life of a believer, this is an important week, the week um, of the Passion. Father, 2,000 years ago, you were expressing your love for us by living out the last week of your life in ministry here on earth and anticipating the reality of your death, your substitutionary death on the cross for us. Father, we're grateful for the love you displayed throughout your ministry. But Lord, as we get to this last week, we see your, your focus on the cross. And Lord, we know that that uh, focus uh, looked through time and saw us here 2,000 years later. Father, your death on the cross was a, a willing uh, sacrifice for the sins that I've committed, for the sins that our group has committed, Father. And it was a desire to restore relationship with us. And Lord, as we, as we dive into that tonight, as we spend this week focused on uh, your uh, death and resurrection on Sunday, Father, I pray that in the background we'll never forget the fact that it was driven by love, love for us. And Father, never uh, in any circumstance in life should we doubt your love for us as we see your love displayed through your, your substitutionary death on the cross. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your love for us. I do pray for each of these young people, Father, and the things that are going on in their lives. Uh, Lord, uh, you know circumstances. You know what's going on. And so, Father, I pray that you'll work in their lives this week to make yourself known to them. And, Father, that as they uh, hear your word taught tonight, as they hear sermons going out on Sunday, Father, as, as, as Easter is celebrated worldwide, God, I pray that the truth of the gospel, the good news of, of your word, uh, will prick their hearts, Father, and drive them forward in their relationship with you like they've never been before. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your love for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So Mark chapter 14 picks up um, just after Palm Sunday. Uh, Palm Sunday was what we celebrated last week, and that was Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. The Passover, uh, um, the Passover holiday is going on in Jerusalem, and Thousands of people have flocked to the city, and Jesus uses that time to enter into the city. And it's the first time in his ministry we see Jesus accept the public adoration of his kingship. Uh, at other times in his ministry, when people acknowledge the fact that he was king, he usually pushed that to the side and asked them not to tell others. He, he never really wore that, that royalty until Palm Sunday, when he came into Jerusalem. The crowds are waving palm fronds. They're, they're celebrating him as the king of the Jews. And, uh, and it begins a tumultuous last week in the, in the ministry of Jesus as he moves through the last week of his life. And Mark chapter 14 summarizes a couple of those weeks. So we're in the middle of that week now. This is Wednesday night as I film this. Uh, it's Wednesday night. And so we are in the middle of Jesus' last week of ministry. So as we think back 2,000 years, Jesus has spent some time in Bethany with friends. Uh, we see him in Mark chapter 14 at the beginning of the chapter eating at Simon the leper's house. Uh, we have a couple references to several Simons in Scripture. We're not really sure where this, where this one comes from, but this is a friend of his. He's hosting a dinner for him, and while he's there, uh, we see a lady come in, and she breaks a, a, an alabaster box of perfume, expensive perfume, over Jesus and anoints his head with that perfume. And we see at that dinner the beginning of maybe some tension in the life of Jesus and his disciple Judas. Judas begins to question the motive why Jesus had allowed this woman to break this box, this expensive box of perfume, and, and, and pour it over Jesus' head. He says, we could have sold that perfume and given it to the poor. And after Jesus rebukes the disciples for murmuring uh, and commends the lady for her, for her foreknowledge, uh, he, uh, we see G Judas begins the process of planning to betray Jesus to the high priest. And so we're in that point in Jesus' ministry now, on Wednesday night, 
that Jesus knows that Judas has begun these conversations with the high priests to, to betray Jesus. And Jesus begins to um, move forward, begin to look forward to the ministry of the cross. And we begin to see that referenced more and more. And if you look through Mark chapter 14, we're not going to take the time to read all 50-something verses tonight. But if you look through Mark 14, the cross is mentioned time and time again. Jesus is looking ahead to the cross. And there's a couple of things I want to look at tonight. This is just a reminder. As we go into the week of Easter, oftentimes as Christians, we look ahead to the resurrection. And we should. The resurrection is the celebration. It's the exclamation point on the sacrifice on the cross. It's, Jesus, his stamp, it's God's stamp of approval. It's Jesus exercising his, his authority over death. And that's what gives us hope as Christ followers. And so that's something we should celebrate and we should look forward to. And we know the end of the story just like Jesus knew the end of the story because we're looking back on it. Jesus was looking forward to it. But in the middle of this week, Jesus is anticipating the cross. And in his humanity, he knows the, the, the suffering he's going to go through. And in his deity, he knows, the re, in, his, in his godness, in, his, in, his, in the reality of being God, he knows what he's about to experience as he takes on the sin of the world. And he experiences God's wrath and judgment for taking on that sin. And so Jesus is looking ahead to the cross in Mark chapter 14. But I want to stop and look. We have the last, the Lord's Supper. And you guys... we. We practice this at Quincy, First Baptist Quincy. Uh, if you've been in Baptist churches before, you've seen the Lord's Supper. Um, uh, you, you, you've experienced the Lord's Supper in church. Uh, and this goes back to Mark chapter 14. This was, the, this was the, uh, the Passover meal that he's taking with his disciples, the Seder meal. And Jesus is, is giving this, this picture as he gives it out. It's the same picture we use today. In Mark chapter 14, and verse 22, he says, And as they did eat, Jesus took the loaf of bread... He blessed it and break it. And he gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. And I want you to think about this. Jesus is with his best friends. These are the friends that he's ministered with for three years on the earth. They've followed him into some dark places. They've experienced some, some triumphs together. And these are men who have loved Jesus and Jesus loves dearly. And as he's standing at the table, he's realizing that in the next 24 hours, he's going to be on the cross. And he's as he's giving them this, this command, as he gives them the bread, he says, look, take this bread and eat it. Just as I'm breaking this bread and giving it to you, my body is going to be broken for you. When we personalize that experience, when we think about it from a human perspective, a friend talking to a friend and saying, in the next 24 hours, I'm going to sacrifice my life for you, think about the love that Jesus had for his disciples. Oftentimes, we... we, we uh, the story of Jesus has been told so many times. We've heard it since the time we were children on our parents' knee or our grandparents' knee as we came to Sunday school. We've heard this gospel story, and it becomes old hat. It becomes just a, a tale that's been told. But think about it from a human perspective. Jesus is looking into the eyes of these men that he loves. He says, take this bread and eat it. As it's broken, as I break it and give it to you, my body's going to be broken because I love you. And because I want to restore fellowship between you and my father. And so Jesus is looking at the cross as he sees his friends. And he's, he's expressing the sacrifice he's about to make. The reality is, as we, as we take the Lord's Supper, as we do the same thing, that same statement is being said to us. Jesus had his body broken out of love for you and I. And so Jesus is giving this. And he also says about the blood, as, as he takes the, the wine and he gives them the wine, the, the fruit of the vine. They take a sip. Jesus says, this represents my blood. That's shed for you. It's this covenant that's shed for you. And the same thing is true for us. Jesus' blood restored fellowship between us and God. It created this new covenant, this new relationship between God and us. And so it was done through love uh, for the purpose of restoration and fellowship. And that's the gospel. That's the story of the gospel that we've talked about. So Mark chapter 14, we have the Lord's Supper. We have this, this intimate fellowship between Jesus and the disciples. And I want you to remember as he's giving that uh, dissertation as he's telling them this command to take the body to take the bread and eat it and it represents the body that's about to be broken for them and take the take the cup and drink it and it represents his blood that's about to be shed there's still one disciple at the table he hasn't left yet who is in the process of betraying Jesus and Jesus is is addressing Judas just as well as he's addressing the rest of the, the disciples. And so Jesus' love extends to everybody. And I don't care what you've done in your life. I don't care where you are in your life. I don't care what mistakes you've made, what sins you've made, what open rebellion you have against Christ. Jesus' blood, his sacrifice, the death on the cross, 
was made in love for you. And as he addressed Judas along with the other 11 disciples, Judas is in the middle of his sin. He's negotiating with the high priest on the cost to betray Jesus, how he's going to do it and what he'll be, what he'll be rewarded with. Jesus looks at him with love and says, look, this body is broken for you. My blood is shed for you. And so that's the good news of the gospel. We've seen that time and time again. Now, I want to look ahead. Uh, after Jesus, is, Jesus confronts uh, Judas, he tells him to go and do uh, what, you, what you need to do. Judas leaves. Um, he goes out to, to do the actual betrayal. Uh, Jesus, um, again, looks into the future, verses 27 to 31. He talks to the disciples about the fact that he is going to be offered, he's going to be sacrificed, that they're going to betray him, or not betray him, they're going to leave him. And Peter makes that famous statement. I love Peter because Peter usually, uh, in Scripture, has his foot in his mouth. He's, got, he's said something, and he's being confronted about it. And again, Peter says, look, Lord, I don't care what the rest of these, these bums do, these other, these other ten guys around the table. I don't care what they do, but I'll follow you wherever you go. I don't care if it's even to the cross, to death. I'll follow you to death, Jesus. And Jesus looks at Peter lovingly and says, Peter, before the, before the morning, before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you're going to betray me three times. And imagine Peter. Peter's probably thinking, there's no way that's possible. I love this guy. I'm sitting across from him. I love him. And yet Jesus knew Peter's struggles that he would face, and he, and he confronts him with that reality. So as they leave out from the, the, uh, the Last Supper, as they leave from the upper room of the Last Supper, Jesus goes to a, a common retreat, a place he would, he would go to regularly called the Garden of Gethsemane. It's outside the walls of Jerusalem. It's an it's a, it's a olive grove. It's still there today. Uh, thousands of years later, some of the trees that are in the olive grove are, are over a thousand years old. So they've been around for a long time. They may be, uh, they may be the fruit of some of these trees that Jesus was under 2,000 years ago. And so Jesus retreats to the Garden of Gethsemane where he spends some time in prayer before his death. And what I want to focus on tonight is this conversation he has with the Father. It's, it's a prayer that Jesus has with his Father. We're going to look at Mark chapter 14. Look at verse uh, 32. It says they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, "Sit you here while I pray." He gives he gives nine of his disciples, I'm sorry, eight of his disciples, the command to sit here while I go and pray. And he takes his three, his closest three. He takes Peter, who he's just told is going to betray him, James and John, and he begins to be sore amazed. It says, and to be very heavy. The weight of the cross, the weight of the reality of his separation from the Father for the first time in eternity, it starts to weigh heavy on, on Jesus as he separates out from, from, the eight, from eight of his disciples and takes three of his closest friends with him. They begin to see the weight of the sacrifice that Jesus is about to make. And it says in verse uh, 34, it says, he says unto them, Peter, James, and John, my soul is exceedingly or exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tear you here and watch. Wait here, watch and pray. I'm struggling, guys. And, and imagine the intimacy of this moment. Jesus has been their anchor and their rock for three years now. Uh, they've watched Jesus weather storm and trial, uh, using this, this amazing calm in, in the midst of trials and circumstances, in, in the midst of storms. He had this calmness and this authority that he spoke over. And in all of these circumstances, they've never seen him the way they see him now. And he says, guys, I need you to wait here. I need you to watch and pray. In verse uh, 35, it says, um, and he went forward a little. He went a, a little farther, farther, uh, farther away. And in another gospel, it says he went about a stone's throw away. And he fell on the ground and he prayed that if it were possible... The hour might pass from him. That, that hour, that hour of separation from God, that, that point in history where Jesus the Son is separated from God the Father for the first time in eternity. And he looks into that point and he says, God, if there's any way, here's the prayer. He says in, in verse 36, and he said, Abba, which is that intimate term that fathers love to hear. It's that little child coming and saying, Daddy. It's that term of endearment, Abba, Father. All things are possible with you. Take away this cup from me. He makes this, this fervent request. I'm a dad. I've got five kids. Think about this. Your son or your daughter as a father comes to you and you see him in agony. He's, he's, he's on the ground. He's, he's, he's burdened about something. And he pleads. He looks up and says, Daddy, please. Or she says, Daddy, please. You can do this. You can help me. You can take care of this. Let this cup pass from me. Let this trial move forward. Don't make me go through this process. 
As a dad, I can't imagine that position. I would move heaven and earth to get my child out of that moment. Jesus is on the ground. He's pleading with his father, saying, Father, I know you can do anything. Anything is possible with you. Please take this cup from me. But then he makes the ultimate uh, confession of submission. He says, but nevertheless, not what I want, but what you will. And that's Christian living, right? That's the, that's the model we've talked about. That's submission to the authority of God. And Jesus exhibits it in his darkest moment, pleading with God the Father, take this cup from me, and ultimately submits to the fact that God's will occurs and not his. Uh, think about it. Why, why would God not grant Jesus' request? We know God's all-powerful. Uh, Jesus was, was appealing to the character, the character of God and saying, you can do all things. You're all powerful. Take, if it's possible, let this cup deal with salvation another way. Find another way for restoration. If it's possible. We know from scripture that the reason, G, that the reason God didn't answer Jesus' prayer was out of love for me and for you. In John 3, 16, the verse we all can quote, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He sacrificed his only son. He turned a deaf ear to Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane because of love. Guys, I don't know what you're going through right now. Look, we're, we're dealing with some trials in life with the coronavirus. Um, you know, work may be cut back. Some of you may be work, dealing with parents who are not working as much. Um, school has been canceled. Uh, you're not able to hang out with friends. Jobs are not going on. Uh, summer plans are starting to get canceled. Um, those are big deals. That's a big, those are big circumstances. Some of you may be dealing with bigger things. Uh, some of you may have sickness going on in your life or in the life of someone in your family. Uh, some of you guys may have um, uh, just heavy things weighing you down. Nothing we experience in life, though, guys, should cause us to doubt the love of God. I want you, when, whatever circumstance you're in, whatever's going on in your life or wherever you are in life, someday in the future when Satan brings something into your life and it seems too heavy to bear, I want you to think back to this moment for Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus is pleading with the Father and says, Daddy, please, please, God, you can do anything. Take this away from me. And God rejects that prayer because God so loved you. That's the story of the gospel, you guys. As we celebrate Easter, as we celebrate the triumph of Easter, I want you to remember this moment in Christ's ministry. I want you to remember the moment where God's love reached out through time and saw us and said, I am going to make a way. And that's the story of the cross. That's the story of this week. As we, as we, as we kind of ride through from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday, a lot's happening in the life of Christ. And you can read about it in Matthew and Mark and Luke. They all carry this week, and they tell a lot about what Jesus went through in this week. So I would encourage you to spend some time reading Mark chapter 14 and 15. Uh, I think it's Matthew 26, um, uh, Luke, late in the late in early teens, late, um, late tens, somewhere in that area. There's these stories of Jesus' last week of ministry. And there's some heavy stuff that goes on in Jesus' life. And it's all done in preparation for the cross, which was done to restore a relationship between you and the Father. What a wonderful truth the gospel is. I pray that you've experienced that gospel. Uh, I know you guys, I've been teaching you guys for about a year now. I know some of you have a clear testimony of your salvation, and that's a wonderful thing. Some of you, I haven't, I haven't heard your testimony. So my prayer for you is that you've reached this point where you recognize that God loved you, and that you uh, have, ex have accepted the love of God, and have submitted your life to him, and you're moving forward in your Christian walk. No matter where you are, guys, use this passage as a point of encouragement. I will tell you it goes on. Uh, the story goes on. Jesus goes back to meet Peter, James, and John in Mark chapter 14, uh, and verse 37. After he submits to God's will, he says, and he comes and finds them sleeping. Peter, James, and John, his best friends, who he's asked to stay and watch and pray. He comes back in this moment of greatest need and finds them sleeping. And he wakes them up and says, why are you sleeping, Peter? Couldn't you watch with me one hour? He asks them again, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is ready, but the flesh is weak. 
I think that's said in reference to, to Peter's future denial. Um, some people believe it's talking about Jesus' struggle with the cross or with the, with the weight of the cross. Uh, but he, he gives him that challenge. He goes away again. He prays and spake the same words he prayed before. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And again, he returns and finds him asleep. Their eyes were heavy. They didn't know how to answer him, it says. And he comes the third time and said to them, sleep on now and take your rest. It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. And that's leading into Jesus' arrest. He, leaves, he came into the garden a free man, weighed down with the burdens of the world. He leaves the garden in chains, arrested, and on his way to trial, which would eventually lead to his crucifixion. And he did it all because he loves you and he loves me. And that's the great news of the gospel. Guys, I can't wait to see you again. Uh, I'm going to ask you one more time. If you've got a phone number or an email, please send it to me. Uh, I'm going to put my stuff on the screen again. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, if, you can, if you do the challenges, send them in. We'll have, a, we'll have a prize again next week. Probably won't be a $20 cash prize, but hey, um, we'll have some type of prize for the winner if you get it in under Alyssa's time, which I can't remember what that was. But I uh, hope you guys are doing well. Looking forward to hearing from you. And again, I'd love to have a Zoom call. I'd love to get us all together. I'd love to see your faces and know what's going on. So contact me. Let me know a way to get a hold of you. Hope you guys are doing well. We'll talk to you guys soon.